Starting off the news this week, a pair of studies published in the journal Icarus have said that Saturn's rings are incredibly young, no older than a few million years. Saturn itself is around four and a half billion years old, so these iconic rings have only surrounded the gas giant for a small part of its lifespan, and only will a short time further, the study claims. Not only are Saturn's rings only a few hundred million years old, they will likely only last a few hundred million more, according to the study. The researchers say that the biggest clue to the age of Saturn's rings, and their dramatic origin, is their colossal size in comparison to other planets in our system. Many planets around the system have rings, it's even believed that Earth may have had rings early on in its lifespan, but only Saturn's rings are quite so massive. Eventually though, Saturn's famous rings will likely be ground down to the same size as those of Uranus or others. In other news, I'd just like to quickly mention NASA's new contract to the spacecraft firm Blue Origin, which has now been tasked with landing astronauts to the moon again in 2029. The preceding Artemis 3 and 4 missions will use SpaceX's Starship as the lander, with Artemis 2 being a test for the capsule which will loop around the moon. And finally from me this week, a study published in the journal Nature has detailed efforts to create a system to allow a man named Gert Jan Oskam to walk for the first time in 12 years. It uses brain implants and the subject thinking about walking to allow use of his legs again. It uses what the study calls a digital bridge between the brain and spinal cord to establish a connection. This connection has remained stable for a year and has allowed Mr. Oscam to use his legs to walk again even independently at home, although he says he feels like a toddler again, relearning how to walk. Despite these challenges, he is now able to stand independently and climb stairs. Naturally, the technology isn't perfect, but it's an amazing advancement that heralds an exciting future. And now over to Ben with the paleontology news. Thanks, Doug. Well, it's been an absolutely action-packed week for paleontology news, with all sorts of amazing new discoveries having been published on. To start us off, we have a very cool new paper describing a new species of large-bodied Gorgonopsian from South Africa. Gorgonopsians are the infamous top predators of the late Permian, a lineage of synapsids related to our mammalian ancestors that could grow to some pretty big sizes. The largest known Gorgonopsian is the 3.5 meter long Inostrancevia, represented by fossils found in Russia, and now also South Africa. Three species of Inostrancevia were considered to be valid, all found in Russia, but this new publication reports the first occurrence of the genus in South Africa, naming it as a new species, Inostrancevia africana. This is a very interesting discovery for several reasons, as before now the largest South African Gorgonopsians had all belonged to a lineage known as the Rubigianae which are only known from Africa and have notably broader snouts compared to an Ostrancevia. But the presence of an Ostrancevia here too, suggests that a faunal turnover occurred among the top predators late in the Permian as the infamous Great Dying approached. The new paper shows that Rubigians appear to have been an early casualty of the disruption of terrestrial ecosystems just before the end Permian mass extinction event, the worst of all Earth's mass extinctions, and were actually replaced as top predators of the region by Inostrancevians migrating from elsewhere. But then the Inostrancevians soon fell victim to the extinction too, with all Gorgonopsians disappearing by the end of the Permian, and then a different synapsid group, the Therakophalians, replacing them as top predators here and then also going extinct in the Triassic. The paper explains how this relatively rapid replacement of different top predator groups illustrates the ecosystem instability around this time, with large terrestrial carnivores being some of the most susceptible groups to these dramatic changes. An absolutely incredible paper there then, significantly expanding our understanding of Gorgonopsian evolution and distribution, and it's amazing that they show these different sequential extinctions of these top predator groups. Also in the news is the publication of a new genus and species of Spinosaur, this time coming from Spain. Named Protathlytus cincturensis, the genus name comes from the Greek for champion, and the material it's based on comprises a fragment of the right maxilla, an upper jawbone, and five tail vertebrae. Protathlytus lived during the early Cretaceous, and it's been classified as a member of the Baryonychian group of Spinosaurs, putting it as a close relative of Baryonyx, Ceratosuchops, and Suchomimus. This new species is from the same formation as Valibona venatrix, a Spinosaurine named in 2019, suggesting that the Iberian Peninsula was inhabited by a diversity of Spinosaurids, including members of both Spinosaurine and Baryonychian subfamilies. 
Later on in the Cretaceous, they then migrated to both Africa and Asia, and it seems that in Europe the Baryonychines became dominant, while the Spinosaurines became more abundant in Africa. An interesting new addition to known Spinosaur diversity then. Up next, there's also been a new genus and species of Mosasaur named this week too. Called Stellodens mysteriosus, this new animal is based on fossils found in the latest Cretaceous phosphate deposits of Morocco, and is represented by a partial jaw along with two teeth. These teeth have a very unique shape, being triangular and with a series of elaborate serrated ridges on the side of the tooth that would have faced the tongue. This unusual tooth morphology is what's given it the name, with Stellodens mysteriosus translating to Star Tooth Mystery. The function of these teeth in catching prey is not known, with the authors stating that it must have either had a highly specialised diet, a very specialised way of capturing prey, or a combination of both. The teeth don't seem to be particularly well adapted for catching fish or soft-bodied cephalopods, and they're also not that well suited to crushing down on hard-shelled prey. Hopefully more discoveries of this fascinating mosasaur can help to elucidate its diet. And finally for this action-packed week is the naming of a new species of sauropod, a new kind of titanosaur from Argentina. Called Chucarosaurus diripienda, it's based on bones from the limbs and hip, and dates to the Upper Cretaceous Huencul formation over 90 million years ago, the same formation that Argentinosaurus, Maposaurus and Meraxes are known from. The unique combination of characteristics displayed in the bones suggests this is a new species, and it's classified within the Colossosauria clade. Now apparently, while transporting the bones of this dinosaur for study, the weight of the fossils actually destabilised the vehicle they were in and caused an accident on the road, which fortunately no one was seriously harmed in. But it did send the bones flying through the air and onto the road. But the bones were so hard that they weren't damaged by this, and instead actually broke the asphalt of the road. This story then explains the name of the dinosaur. Chucaro means hard and indomitable animal in the area's indigenous Quechua language, and diripienda is Latin for scrambled, both referring to the breaking of the road and the scrambling of the bones by the accident. A very creative name there then, and an amazing addition to our understanding of South American sauropods. Well that's it for the paleontology news this week, I really hope you enjoyed learning about all the amazing discoveries that have been made, and we'll see you next week. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for this week's Seven Days of Science. I do hope you've enjoyed, and we'll see you next week.